Well, all righty. Thank you, everybody, for coming to hang out for uh, this 2 o'clock session here. Welcome to Always always Like a Gift Trojan Horse in the Mouth. And um, it just might be the case that uh, the King of Troy should have, you know, been a bit more careful with his security awareness training. But he certainly did not, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, besides the random credential harvesting phishing emails that I get every day, uh, a lot of them is just flat out emotet all day, all the time. And uh, that's really what we're talking about here today. And the emotet, it's, uh, it's the malicious documents that are, uh, that are being downloaded and where uh, people are clicking the uh, fateful enable content. And so what we're going to be talking about today is just how to rip those apart and how to get the important indicators of compromise that can show, hey, has, did somebody click the thing? Did they enable the content? Did, they, did all the other bad things happen? Did they happen? Now, all in all, it is really fun to click on things that you know you shouldn't. I can see why end users do it, but it's even better to get paid for it. So let's begin. Now, of course, as always, it starts with an email and uh, pretty typical, you know, whatever the theme is. I really don't care about the theme. I don't track it that way. I really just, oh, it's an invoice or it's AT&T bill or it's whatever. To me, it really doesn't matter. I'm, I don't focus on that. But um, of course, what's the bad thing here? The bad thing here is that that's not really DocuSign. It's really taking you to the Luxor Club and uh, WP content, of course, right? And uh, all in all, yeah, that's suspicious. But what's on the other end? What would happen if an end user actually did click on the thing? Well, it would prompt you to download a document. And if you open it up, it says to enable content. Now, before we get into the document itself, there are still some important indicators of compromise that we can pull so far. One of them is who it's from, the subject, and maybe even the originating IP address that, that it came from. That's information that you can go and give to your favorite email admin to say, hey, search for this, it's bad, and nuke all of them in the environment, or quarantine them however uh, it works in your environment. Other things that are good to know too, the URL itself. Give that to your favorite sis or to your favorite firewall admin and to say, hey, is there any traffic headed outbound to there? If so, well then we've got a problem. And finally, what about the name of the document itself that got downloaded or even the document hash? Is that information that you could put into some sort of endpoint detection and response uh, tool that can search and comb your environment or if it sees that it does drop on the endpoint there, it can actually find that uh, based on the hash or just the name? That's all good stuff to know. That's all good stuff to know. So before I actually go and you know enable content, one thing that I always do is look to check, hey, well, see, enabling content is evidence that there is a macro in it at all. Well, what I want to do first is to extract the macros and check them out to see if they can give us any information. There's a couple tools that we can use for that. One of them is Office Mail Scanner. It's a really simple tool. You just take the tool and you point it at the document and there you go. Now, if anybody is a picture taker, yeah, you can totally do that. I don't care if you want. But at the very end of this presentation, I've got three slides that list all of the tools, where you can find them, how to use them too. So uh, we'll have plenty of time for picture taking later if, if you like. Or do it now, whatever folks are going. But Office Mail Scanner, it's really quite easy. You just point it at it. And uh, Office Mail Scanner works really good for doc files and docx. It's really good on those two. And uh, in this case, it found three uh, macros right there, and it yanked them out and put them in on a separate folder. And you can just check them out that way. Another really good tool is OLE Dump. Uh, it's a Python script here. And this is a really good one, because not only is it good on doc files, docx, but Emotet uh, lately has been doing uh, XML files disguised as doc files. Office Mail Scanner can't handle that, so uh, OLE Dump can. Again, a really simple tool to use. Only dump pointed at the document, and you're going to see that here are all the macros listed out. And if it has a capital M, or even a lowercase m next to it, we want to extract those. How do we do that? Well, you just choose the S, choose the macro number, like there's number 8, V for verbose, output it to a text file, and there you go. You've got, your, you've got what you need. Well, then, now that having been done, what actually happens with the macro? Here they go. Here they are. 
And uh, yeah, it looks like pretty horrendous stuff. But if you start filtering out the garbage and actually looking at you know what's useful, you can really help to it helps to filter out a lot of this. Now, what I do then when I'm looking at this, I just look for something that looks like an actual word or something in English rather than all this extra just gibberish right there. Once I do that, I start following the variables to see how they're being used, and we can see here that. Auto open, that means that when you click enable content, all of that is going to run right away. But here, buried in this one, I see P-O-W-E-R-S-H-E-L-L-E. -E. Oh, PowerShell, there we go. Now, whatever this is doing, it's gonna to toss it in that variable, so that's gonna be important later, but notice we've got a whole bunch of more variables coming after that. What are those ones? Well, let's find out. Looking here, we got we can see that uh, same PowerShell dash E right there, and in this variable, that points to this function. Inside this function, we've got a whole bunch more garbage code, but buried in here is this one. We've got a big long string of characters, and another big long string of characters, and more, and all of those get all put together in a big long line and tossed and returned into that. That is interesting. Looking also, there's another function of the same name here, and what we can see is when mgmts win32 processed is tossed in there, that variable is used here, get object of this win mgmts win32 process startup, and uh, down here we've got another get object and a create. So all of those strings, those big long strings, are all being put together and all being tossed into this mix right here, and then it's going to be assembled. Once it is assembled, it looks like this. PowerShell dash E in a whole big long string of base64. Now, the question is, how do you, you, get from here to where it is going to be assembled? How do we get this output of it having been assembled? Again, there's a bunch of tools that can help with that. So to get from the Mac to the PowerShell, we're going to be using uh, ViperMonkey, uh, another couple of behavior analysis ones, command watch from Kahoot Security, they got uh, anybody heard of them, they've got a bunch of other tools out there that are useful, uh, process spot control and process hacker itself. Let's start with ViperMonkey. Again, another very simple tool to use. ViperMonkey, and you just point it at the document and you let it fly. See, ViperMonkey is an emulator. It's not actually going to enable content or trigger anything. It just looks at it and it says, hey, what's going to happen with, it analyzes all the VBA code and once it is done, and it does take a little bit of time, it spits out at the end here, hey, PowerShell dash E, and there is all of the base 64. So very handy tool to use. Another way of doing it though is actually you're going to have to open the document and enable content. So when you do that in your analysis, analysis machine, don't have it pointed at the real internet. <laughs> Shut down the interface because I've, of course, never infected my machine. Right? Talk to anybody who works with malware, and yes, 50% of them will say, oh, of course, I've never ransomware myself. Oh, they're lying. They're lying. They're every time. Anyway, Command Watcher, how does it work? This is the one from Cognitive Security. Uh, this one, uh, what it does is it looks for different processes to spawn. Command, PowerShell, run DLL32, W script. You click Start. Open the document, enable content, and it interrupts PowerShell in this case. We're opening and it shows you, hey, PowerShell was called, and uh, here's what it was, here's the command line that was fed to it. So that's a way to get it. Process spot control is a way of doing that in PowerShell. You run this script, PowerShell control, or sorry, process spawn control, and uh, it's going to sit there and wait. Open the document, enable content, and it'll say, hey, this wants to run PowerShell, run by the parent process, WIPRBSE. You want to allow it, keep it suspended, but underneath here we've got the new spawn process, and here's the command line that was fed to it. So again, another way of doing this. My preferred way, really quick and dirty, it's not complicated, and that is just have process hacker open, enable content, watch and WIPRBSE, Hit, uh, once PowerShell opens up, quick, double click it, and then you'll get the properties of it, and there you can find the command line right down there. Yeah, quick and dirty, but it's what, it's what, you, it's what you want. So however we got here, now what? We've got a whole bunch of base64 encoded information. What do we obviously want to do? We want to un base 64 it, if that's the right way to put it. Uh, what I like to do is uh, CyberChef. CyberChef, anybody here 
Fans of it? Yeah, all right. Well, this is perfect uh, application for what we're going to be doing today. Uh, CyberChef is great because you feed information into the top, and then you pull in all of these different operations or recipes, maybe ingredients, because it's CyberChef, I guess I haven't really thought about it. Anyway, you take them and you drag them over here, and one of them is from Base64. So here's the input. You from Base64, it's going to undo it, and then we're going to get the output here. So let me kind of, you know, here's the output from having it been on Base64, and we see a whole lot of English words. That's fine, still very tough to read. So then the next thing that we want to do is to uh, use another recipe called remove null bytes. That's going to be all these extra periods and things in there. And uh, once we do that, it'll transform the data to this. Looks better. But now we have a bunch of these um, apostrophe plus apostrophe or sky commas for some of you. Uh, but we have a whole bunch of those all over the place. And so let's get rid of those. Well, there is the find replace. And let's get rid of that and replace it with nothing. Once we're done with that, then here's how to transform the data. Slightly better. But if we look at it carefully, we can see that we've got a whole big line in red here. We've got a whole bunch of data. But then surrounding that is memory string convert from base. Oh, so all of this is base 64. This is going to unmit base 64. And then wrapped around that is compression deflate string. Well, there are CyberChef recipes to do that. So we need to copy out the base 64. We put it back in the top. And then we use these two recipes from base 64 and then raw inflate. And we get, ta-da, this. What do we see? We see a one, two, three, four, five URLs, and we see a whole bunch of other PowerShell commands down here. But let's clean this up a little bit, and we can see that, yeah, makes a net web client. And here in this variable, we've got the five URLs. They're split on the at symbol. We've got another interesting one right here. 872 is tossed into that variable. This one is pointing to the your user profile slash 872 is tossed right there dot exe. And then for each of the what items in this uh, in that variable right there, it's going to try to download the file to that location, rename it 872.exe, and then invoke it. So we've got our five URLs. That is now five indicators of compromise that would be important to, to hunt for. Now, the last two things that you can do here if you really want to clean up your data even more is just uh, use these two recipes, uh, extract URLs and split on the at symbol, and then you'll get a nice, lovely list of five lines that you can take and uh, copy-paste them to wherever the heck you want, I guess. Now, what are other ways that the Emotech crew have been over the past couple months, what are other ways that they have been uh, encoding their uh, PowerShell or code right there? Well, in this case, uh, they were doing this for a while. Just to get to command.exe, they would do dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, windows, and finally get to it as a way to just execute that. This one was interesting, though, because we have a huge long string of data right there being, ta being uh, tossed into XHOY. And then for each character in there, it's going to start at character 497, count backwards, and end at zero. Well, character 497 is this one, P. Go reverse, O-W-E-R-S-A-O. -E so what this is doing is just reversing all of that, tossing it into that variable, and then once it's done, calling it. Yeah, and it gets my stuff. Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, this is an interesting one, too. Um, there's been variations on this so, uh, for a while now, too. Again, we see the dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, command, dot, exe. We've got a big, huge, long string of characters right here. And then for each of these characters in this big, what, array? I don't know the right words. Array might be the right thing. There's dictionary. I don't know which one. But anyway, for each one of those, 71. Character number 71, save it, 56. Character 56, character 30, character 27. Everything you need to know is right there, but this is rearranging it all in the correct order, tossing it in this variable, and then piping it into command so that it will execute. Now, to go through and undo all of that, I'm not going to do that by hand. But what you can do is open up, this is PowerShell, right? Open up PowerShell, copy and paste from set all the way down to right before the pipe. So copy from the set down right before the pipe, because all of that has to be unscrambled before it gets to the command. Well, if you can copy and paste that, toss it in the PowerShell uh, command prompt, 
PowerShell will do all the work for you and then spit out, well, the decoded commands. And then you'll get your five URLs that way. Again, don't copy and paste in the pipe to the command. That will be bad. It will actually do the things it's trying to do. Finding and replace this one was, well, really quite silly. I mean, we've got, again, a big long string of characters, but down here, dot replace, and what are replacing? Anytime you find a triple zero, it's replaced it with whatever is in that variable. Well, nothing is in that variable. But what we see here is new object.com, and if you get rid of all of those uh, zeros, you'll end up with uh, what? HTTP, there's an IP address, and all of that. So, again, for CyberChef, it'd be easy to just copy and paste all of this. They have their find and replace recipe, toss in the three zeros, replace it with nothing, and you'll get out the five URLs that you needed. Oh, and then they did JavaScript, <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, that's something that they've been doing uh, much more recently. This is one of the first ones that they tried with, uh, you can see the one, two, three, four, five URLs just plain as day sitting out there just to annoy everybody apparently. And then they did obfuscated JavaScript, which is making this much, much more difficult. Because up here, we've got a whole bunch of variables and you see like the equals equals sign right there. Every single one of these strings is all base64 encoded. Oh, I could just take each one individually and base64 decode it. No, 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 because there's another function down there that takes what has been decoded, runs its own unencryption, obfuscation script on it. It's a big pain in the body. <laughs> it really is. There's no easy way to do this. So in this case, what I've been doing then is uh, taking them and tossing it into an online sandboxer called any.run. Is everybody here familiar with it? Yes. If you're not familiar with it, we're going to talk about it near the end of this presentation. But it's super awesome. It's Okay, we'll talk about it more, but anyway, uh, what it does is it actually uh, ran the JavaScript and hey, it, here's the error that was buried in that JavaScript code saying, oh, there's an error, oh, bummer, sorry about you. But in the background, it's actually reaching out to the one, two, three, it's reaching out to the URLs and you can pick them up that way. All right? So, oh, we're not done. This one is uh, much more recent too. With uh, The interesting thing about this is that here you can see all of the jumbled up URLs. And what's happening here is that it's going to find the 30th one, one, two, three, four, oh, sorry, zero, one, two, three, blah, 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 find that one, and it's just rearranging all of these chunks into the right order up there, tossing it to MU4, uh, MU4D, and down here it's going to go through them and invoke it and all the same PowerShell stuff that we've been seeing this whole time. So, whatever way <laughs> they're doing it, whatever way that they're going to end up doing it, we've now added to our list of indicators of compromise, and that is these five URLs right there, and also where is it going to be landed on the endpoint itself? That might change. That's why it's important to be able to do this manually so that you can see, hey, where is it going to be? If something is infected, I might be able to find uh, it at that location. Well then, at this point, we've pretty much done all we can with the document. We've got the URLs, we know where it's going to land. Now, here comes the fun part. Go to one of these websites and try to download the executable. Don't download and run it, but just save it. Save it off of the side. Again, not that I've made that mistake. But anyway, uh, what can then we do with that executable? We want to know how it runs. We want to know what it's going to do. Well, there's some tools that can give us an idea of what's going to happen. One of them is called PE Studio. And uh, you just take the executable, toss it in there, and it runs just a bunch of different checks on them. They're really quite simple. Like one of them is, you know, it'll give you the MD5 hash or the SHA-1, 2, 256, I don't know, whichever one it is. And it'll give you that information, that's good to know. But another thing it does is it comes through the executable and it looks at the import address table to try to figure out, hey, what is this piece of software, what's this malware going to borrow from the operating system in order to function? Because not all the code is baked into the malware, it's gonna borrow something. And if we look at that address table, it, we can get an idea of what it might do. Well, in this case, here are all the different Windowsy things that it's going to be uh, it's going to be pulling in, like remove directory, interesting, switch to fiber, get current thread ID, get process ID, okay, create process. None of this is really that 
eye-opening. I mean, we could totally go to MSDN and search every single one and get an idea, but it's really not that obvious, which means that, oh, it's Emotet. It's probably PAC, which means it has some sort of wrapper that's going to run to make it tougher to analyze. Where if we, so if we compare what, the, what, uh, what was being imported here with another one, look at this one. Um, Let's see, what do we have here? Oh, registry open key, registry close key, registry set value. Okay, so we know for sure that this one is likely to do something to, do you have a question? No, I'm scratching. All right, I thought you may have had a double question because you're raising both hands, but all right. All right, all right. Uh, anyway, uh, exit process, I.O. Oh, import, uh, see input output control socket. Okay, so this one certainly sounds a lot more like it's going to be, I mean, it, it, it's a bit more obvious what it's going to be doing. Well, the thing about this one is that this one is from a, a worm from 2004 called Doom Juice. And, uh, oh, it's a worm. So it makes sense then that it's going to be doing some socket, you know, and, uh, some socket ones, and it's going to be messing with your registry and all that. Again, we didn't see that with the Emotet one. Oh well, sometimes you're not always lucky, but we did get a couple more uh, bits of information right here, MD5, the SHA-256, that's stuff to know. So that was our initial analysis here. Now, it's time to click the thing. Double click the thing, excuse me. Now, the fun is to be had, but the thing about malware is that malware can hide, but it must run. And when it runs, it's going to do stuff. And if we can watch that stuff, if we can pay attention to it, if we can see what it's writing and what it's doing, watch all the threads and the processes that it's opening, that's all the information that is good for us to know and how it behaves. And so there's a bunch of different tools that we're going to be using for that. Uh, one is RedShot. RedShot is nice. It's a simple tool. All you have to do is just uh, before you run the malware, all you do is you take a shot, and it takes a shot of your registry, complete shot of it. Then you run your malware, wait till it's done doing its thing, and then you take a second shot of your registry, and it does a diff on them. What's changed? So, I mean, it, it, if it does change anything, it really does stand all that concern. You, you'll get a bunch of output, but you'll see what has changed. That's good. Uh, Wireshark, everybody's favorite. Uh, should be self-explanatory, I hope. Network traffic, for those of you who are going to pay attention to network traffic and see what it's doing. Process monitor. This one is a beast. You just Turn it on, and it what I actually have good notes here, don't I? What does process monitor do? Ah, yes, monitors all changes to the system. So anything that has been written also covers registry, any new processes, new threads. It creates a ton of output. In fact, one of them here, um, yeah, it was just running for like maybe 10 seconds, and it created you know 50,000 different uh, events all in here. And then uh, process hacker is your. Um, Cast manager on steroids, basically. <laughs> it's really nice. Uh, it's a lot that we can do. So let's look at Process Hacker here. Once we start it, we can see that 872.exe, it makes a copy of itself. OK, that's interesting. After it does that, then it creates a new one, spawns off a new process called eapmetagen.exe, and then it kills itself. See how 872 is gone? That's interesting. So the parent process disappears. The child process is still there as its own process. So it makes it tougher to find who that parent is afterwards. Huh, interesting. Well, then what can we do with uh, this just sitting here running? Well, if we double click on it, we can see the different properties here. And one of them is where it is running from. So 872.exe, we know where that one was going to land because that's what the PowerShell script did. And then we can also see, hey, once it does run, where is the child process likely to be? And it would be that location right there. That's really good if you're looking for infected systems. Now, another thing that you can do at this point is, um, as this is running, there's another tab here called memory. If we click on that, we can start looking through all of the different strings that it has in memory. And what do we see? IP address, IP address, IP address. Could be C2 information. More on that in a little bit, but uh, yeah, this is just, you know, it, all the information is, is just right there. Process monitor, uh, again, watches your system and uh, just gives you a ton, ton of output. And uh, in this case, I haven't filtered on PowerShell and you created, yeah, 20,000 events after just you know, about 10 seconds of being on. And yeah, the thing about uh, Process Monitor is that it is completely atrocious to comb through and try to find anything. 
I mean, it's really bad. So there are lovely tools that we can use to show all of this graphically, one of them being ProcDoc. Anyone familiar with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what you can do is you can take the output from Process Monitor, save it as a CSV, import it into ProcDoc, and you get this lovely graph of it starting and doing all the things that it did in a lovely graphical view. So let me zoom in here a little bit, and we can see 872 creating its own child process of itself, and then this one ends up creating EAP metagen right there, which is living at this address, and then this one has threads and it starts, oh, it looks like it's changing some things to the registry. So all this information after a click, and we're gonna point your click on it. Don't point it to the internet. But uh, all this information is all just you know right there as we're watching this behaviorally. Of course, we can watch Wireshark and uh, just turn it on, let it fly, and uh, you'll see that after a little bit, after uh, very regular intervals, it's going to try to reach out to different IPs. Definitely, it's command and control. It's C2 IP address that it's going to go to. If you get that list, send it to your favorite firewall or smart person, hey, if you see any, any traffic out to these IPs, we're going to have a bad day. OK, sorry, so. So there, now, that has given us a whole bunch more information. One is that on the endpoint, we can see where EAP metagen is going to end up being. We can see that EAP metagen, that EXC, also shares the same MD5 and hash flow because it was a copy of you know, the, uh, the original. And we've got a whole bunch of command and control information that we have now gathered from this. Finally, OK, not finally, I'm not done yet, but debugging. Has anyone ever tossed anything into a disassembler and looked at Base64 and wanted to gouge your eyes out? I can see the pain in your face right there. Yeah. What would the value of this be? If we were to look at the traffic, the C2 traffic that you know, actually did take and pointed my uh, VM to the actual internet and let Emotet fly and watch the traffic and you know, try to look at it. What's it actually doing? Well, of course, it's all encoded information. They don't want people like me to see what it is that they're sending back and forth. Well, in uh, a disassembler or in a debugger, it should make sense that before Emotet actually sends out any information, it has to collect it. Before it actually encodes it, encrypts it somehow, it has to have it all gathered together. It should be possible then to intercept that point and actually look and see what it has uh, put together that it's about to send off. That would give us a lot of information. Well, that's the sort of thing that can be done if you're good at assembly and just walking through all this. It is really kind of interesting just to you know walk through it. Very frustrating too, but uh, I did not do this because that goes beyond the scope of this presentation, which is code for it, it's really hard. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I mean, but that all, information is all in there, and uh, there's been a lot of different write-ups about that. The most recent one I saw is this guy right here, Persianov.net. He did uh, his own part two. His part one was all about the analyzing the document and the macro and stuff, but that right there was him actually walking through and his uh, adventure in, um, in uh, debugging this and going through and seeing how it all works, when it spawns, what it's and, uh, and all of that. So fascinating reading if you can't fall asleep. Now, at this point, we have now crawled from the mouth of the Trojan horse all the way through and we've emerged out the other end here. And uh, it might be the case that uh, at this point you still may have no idea what you're doing and that's fine. There's help, there's help. Uh, online analysis. This is just an easy way for have someone else to, to do all the work. And of course, there's everybody's favorite, virus total. Uh, really, really useful just giving it thumbs up, thumbs down, depending upon if it's really well known or not. And uh, that's about all I can really say about virus total. That's, that, that's all it's good for. All right. Uh, another sandbox online. Uh, I like this one a lot. Hybrid analysis. Uh, it gives uh, just choose on it, and it gives a really good graphical output, a whole lot of information about what it's doing. Uh, you know, the different I, the different ports and IPs that it, uh, that it ran out to, where it's actually going, uh, what are all the different um, uh, functions that it imported uh, before it ran, uh, the different mutants that it created. It just gives you a whole bunch of information, and this one was my favorite until Andy Brian. Oh my goodness. 
any run is amazing. Every time uh, there's a free version and the pay for version, the free version is amazing. Anytime you toss it something, uh, it spins up a brand new VM and it watches and it's it's just beautiful. It is so beautiful. So here's the VM right here. And down here we've got WinWord. You can totally see that. I know you can. Uh, but down here we've got WinWord. It's calling PowerShell 872 and uh, all the processes afterwards and afterwards. And uh, down here we've got all, uh, let me just zoom in here. Um, if we were to click on any one of these, it would pop up and we can see PowerShell. Very bad. Why? Well, because it's got all this Base64. That's the same Base64 that we saw. We could copy and paste that and analyze it and do whatever we wanted, all of it right there. And then we go to the next process, there's 872 running, which calls uh, EAP me talking right there. And what does it do? We can see that it ends up uh, adjust, uh, messing with the Windows, Microsoft Windows current version run uh, registry key. Oh, that's the persistence mechanism right there. That's cool. It's all That information is all right there. And then afterwards, this one ran long enough where Emote had actually called back on its C2 channel and then downloaded what came after Emotype, which in this case was TrickBot. Now what was TrickBot doing? TrickBot, it ran a bunch of commands that were caught. Stop WinDefend. Stop Windows Defender. Delete WinDefend. Well, that's cool. Uh, set a preference. Disable real-time monitoring. True. And all of that. So all of this information was just brought to the surface just, just by this wonderful, wonderful sandbox here. Um, we can also see, uh, here's the request to access press.rdsarkar.com, word by another WordPress site, go figure. And uh, here's all of the C2 traffic. All of this information is brought up, but there is a danger to relying only on these online sandboxes. Right there. That's one out of the five URLs. If I was only relying on this, I'd say, oh, there's the one that's bad, but no, there are still four more. You have to be able to do this by hand. You have to be able to do this manually so that you're able to catch everything, every indica indicator of compromise possible. So, fair warning. Be careful about that. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Don't some of them detect, like, I'm on VM, I'm going to act differently? Yes. Yes, they can. Yes. Uh, the question was, uh, isn't some malware uh, trying to be aware that it is running from inside a sandbox? And yeah, they totally can. Um, I think there's... Uh, I can't speak specifically on that, not because of a secret or anything, I just can't remember. But yeah, you're right, some of them do, and uh, in some cases, sometimes they'll just wait a long time. Any dot run is nice because you can keep adding minutes onto it. For the free version, it's up to five, but really, I don't know if all of them care too much to actually write that in there. But, but anyway, uh, yeah, you're definitely right. So if you get no results, maybe try a different online sandbox. But yeah, no, very good question, very good question. Uh, last one here is Cape. And uh, very similar to any run or um, the hybrid analysis one. However, one thing that they toss on here is that if it detects that the binary you've tossed up there is Emotet, it's actually going to extract the RSA public key that it used and all of the uh, C2 URLs. So that's just you know less work that you have to do on the front or the middle end. It, it, it just has it all right there. And what they base that off is the work from this guy right there, Dor D 0 rt He was writing his own, um, you know, reversing the, uh, the packer surrounding uh, Emotet. It really interesting stuff. Check it out if, if that's your thing, or just use it here in Cape. I think Cape may have modified it since that point and adjusted it for them. But but anyway, well. We have now come to the presentation where if you'd like to take pictures, feel free. Uh, again, my setup that I'm using is just a VMware workstation on top of a Windows, or a Windows 10 analysis machine. That's where I do all of my stuff uh, using Microsoft Office. Again, completely off my corporate network. This doesn't touch anything, and uh, so that's my, that's my pipe to all of the evil that exists. What did I use to extract macros? That would be uh, Office Mail Scanner, OLE Dump. You can find them right there. Now, Office Mail Scanner, it's been a long time since it's been updated. I think 2013. It still works really well. It has a disclaimer. Yes, I believe, yes. He does have some sort of disclaimer saying, I don't know, maybe it's very old. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's old. But again, it still works when you need it. Uh, OLE Dump, it's really nice. Dieter Stevens, he does a lot on the RE side of things, and uh, it's, uh, his, his work is really good, too. What about then macro analysis? We had Viper Monkey. That was the uh, 
It, actually, it didn't actually execute the document. It just combed through it and was uh, emulated all the DB script. Command watcher, process spawn control, interrupted those. Process hacker was the quick and dirty way. It's also just a handy tool to have. And then a uh, good old cyber chef, which everyone loves. Also, behavioral analysis. What is it that we did? Again, malware has to run. When it runs, it does stuff. So process hacker, process monitor, pop doc, red shot, wire shark, all those things really good to have on your reverse engineering platform. And then uh, for the to analyze the executables themselves, PE Studio, X64 Debug, uh, NSA had their release of uh, Gidra, I think it's called. That's their reverse engineering platform. I messed around with it. Yeah, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> it works. I think it's going to get better. And then um, finally, uh, online analysis, uh, that's where all of those are used. Now, there's a whole lot of people out there who uh, do work specifically on Emotech and releasing this information that they've analyzed. One of them is uh, the CryptoLemus1 account on Twitter. That's run by four people, Unix Ronin, Jay Rusin, PS66UK, and DevNull. You know, I was in my head saying DevNull Noop, but no, it's DevNull Noop. Yeah, no. But anyway, uh, yeah, those are the four guys behind that account. That account right there spits out so much information, really quick, up-to-date information on what's the latest URLs that Emotet is using, and also uh, keeps track of a lot of the C2 infrastructure. It was these guys who noticed that, oh, huh, there seems to be one big group of C2 infrastructure over here, and then another one. It's only those two. And then about maybe a year later, you had, uh, I can't remember who it was, they wrote an article saying, oh, we've noticed that there are two different big, you know, groups that even test using. And these guys are like, yeah, we know, we know. Again, really solid guys. And uh, a great place. Uh, everything that they dump, all those IOCs, especially if when it comes to downloading an executable or downloading a malicious document, uh, is this place, urlhouse.abuse.ch. If you really want up-to-date, bad malware, that can be downloaded from anywhere. That's the place you want to go. But you do. It's fun. It, it truly is. <laughs> right? Let's get up to date. Who am I? I'm just this guy. I'm a senior cybersecurity engineer from American Transmission Company. I'm also a SANS mentor. I've taught classes here in Milwaukee in the Chicago area. And are there any questions? I've never done that. Totally. Never done that. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. How badly have you messed up your own network? My own network? Now, are you mean my own corporate network, or? Your own network. I have, uh, Look at yeah, I've uh, uh, ransomware myself. I, I just let something fly, I'm like, oh, that's interesting, and I was typing away, and then, oh, all right, and then Wireshark was running, all of a sudden, tons of traffic, like, oh, this is interesting, right? Yeah, ransomware myself, and that's why you work on a VM, sir. That's why you work on a VM. Anything else? Otherwise? Thank you. Thank you very much for spending some time with me. I hope you enjoyed the session.